Michael Lamb established this series of lectures that brings together the Augustinian tradition and the sciences. And um, unfortunately, Dr. Lamb could not be with us this evening. He did want to come, but was not able to, uh, to make the trip. Um, so this, this series is a way of trying to interconnect um, the Augustinian tradition, the sciences, faith, and culture. Um, it's kind of a nice way to think about Augustine and his very positive take on what it meant to be in his society and to find truth wherever it could be found and to um, honor it wherever it might be found. And, and that little lead-in is kind of a, a, a nice backdrop for being able to introduce Dr. Victoria Sweet. Um, PhD in history, written a couple of books on Hildegard of Bingen. Um, and also um, an associate clinical professor of medicine at the University of California. So in some ways, trying to combine all that can come from the, the study of history and all that can come from the study of medicine. And I'm sure you're going to talk to us much more about how those things fit together um, in your own experience. Um, it's a particular pleasure, in other words, to have someone who is moving across boundaries, who is trying to pull out of a, a multi kind of perspective, um, something that can be offered to the world. Her book, God's Hotel, um, has now come out in paperback. Of course, we have put forms back there for anybody who would like to, to order it, uh, just take a card with you. Um, and it, it is, once again, the fruit of an experience of trying to pull together an understanding of history and an understanding of practice for the benefit of human beings. And in her own presentation for us tonight, she's going to um, talk about, as you can see, a doctor, a saint, a pilgrimage to the heart of medicine. Um, so it's a little bit about her story. But well beyond her story, it's about the challenge of making sure our stories are of benefit to the rest of the world. So I thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, I don't like long introductions. No, 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 I'm this sure is you don't either. This is great. This floor is yours. And it's beautiful. Thank you. That was perfect. You'll think we've, we, we got together on this because uh, what he touched on is exactly some of the things I, I do want to touch on. Um, first of all, I want to thank him for inviting me and thank Dr. Lamb in absentia for uh, having put this together because this idea of faith in science or the humanities in sciences is, I think, a really important theme. And I was particularly excited to, to get this invitation uh, from an Augustinian university, a Catholic university, and, and to get to be asked to, to think about faith in science, humanities in science. It got me thinking about the, by the way, can everybody hear me? Is it, is it good? Okay. And come on in. I just started. It got me thinking about the opposition between faith and science. And about these questions I sometimes get asked because I'm a bit of an iconoclast. Do you believe in the evolution? Do you believe in the Big Bang Theory? Don't you believe in plate tectonics? Um, and I always find that an interesting question that I'm supposed to believe in these things. It also got me thinking about the star of my PhD, which was St. Hildegard of Bingen, and where she would have stood on the subject of faith and science. She didn't seem to find them opposed to one another, it seems to me. For instance, in her medical book, she hardly ever refers to faith. She mostly simply tells you how to make a diagnosis, according to her lights, and how to put together an herbal prescription. And in her theology, what's interesting is she assumes the medieval scientific version of things, which isn't our way of looking at the universe. It's not our science, but it was medieval science. And she didn't seem to find anything in opposition to her faith. Of course, for centuries, there was an opposition between faith and science, and it is what defined modernity. I like this. 
picture as sort of an example of how she combined, uh, combined the two. But this opposition between faith and science defined modernity. And what I think is so interesting about today is that the distinction is starting to blur. We know now, for instance, that what we believe changes what we observe so that there's no real possibility for truly objective observation. So belief and observation, faith and science, don't seem as far apart as they once did. And there's a way in which post-modernity and pre-modernity are a lot alike. It's one of the things I really liked about studying Hildegard at the same time as I was practicing medicine. And what I'd like to do today is tell you some stories about that. First of all, you should know, can I, can I get away from this or not? Oh, good. First of all, you should know that I don't think of myself as a natural doctor, as a born doctor. So for instance, when I was growing up, <clears throat> I never watched doctor shows. I didn't volunteer at hospitals. I didn't want to see or even hear about sick bodies. And when I told my family I was going to medical school, they were shocked. But what had happened was, at the end of college, I had discovered Carl Jung, his memoir, Memories, Dreams, and Reflections. And I loved what he took to his life, the depth and meaning that he wanted to get out of his life. And I especially loved the way he set up his life, Reading, uh, seeing articulate, well-paying patients in the morning in his house on the lake of Zurich, and reading uh, medieval manuscripts and alchemy in the afternoon. So I decided that's what I wanted to be when I grew up a Jungian analyst, and that's how I got to medical school. But it turned out I liked medical school a lot more than I thought I would. By the way, could you hear me when I went over here? Could anybody not? It's okay? I can wander? Okay, good. I ended up liking medical school a lot more than I thought I would, especially the last two clinical years when, as a medical student, you finally get to see patients and examine them, and you learn what's called the workup. So there's the history where you talk to patients and you have to really listen to what they say and what they don't say. There's a lot of psychology to it. And I loved examining the patients, touching their bodies, because there were so many diagnoses I could figure out just by examining them. And then there was putting it all together into, into the diagnosis and the treatment and the plan. It's called the workup, and I thought it was brilliant. But nevertheless, I continued on into my psychiatric residency, which turned out to be in the only locked uh, psychiatric hospital in my county. So you can imagine I did not see articulate, well-paying patients. I saw uh, very psychotic patients who did not respond to talk therapy and responded very well to the antipsychotic medications we gave them. So after I got my medical license, I just went out and started practicing medicine. And I mostly practiced medicine in small community clinics. These community clinics, I don't know whether you have them here, but out in California where I'm from, they, got, they get the wave of every immigrant. Every time there's a war or a rumor of a war, we would get a wave of immigrants with all of their diseases, their different ways of looking at the body. I saw three cases of leprosy. I saw every parasite you can imagine. Very many interesting diseases and cancers and unusual uh, infectious diseases. Eventually, I went back and did my three years of my medical residency. And then I started practicing medicine uh, in, a, in a similar kind of place, actually. I was more and more impressed by modern medicine. The longer I practiced medicine, the more I was impressed by its method, its logical scientific method for arriving at a diagnosis and a treatment. But I was also more and more impressed by what modern medicine left out. Naturally, anything that didn't fit its logical method. So I started looking at alternative medicines. I looked at naturopathy and homeopathy, and I looked especially at Chinese medicine and Ayurvedic medicine. They were very interesting. And I even thought about learning Chinese or Sanskrit so I could really understand them. 
But I finally decided that even if I did that, I still wouldn't really get them. They were just too far culturally from who I was. It was at this discouraging moment that I discovered a book in the library that intrigued me. It was Hildegard of Bingen's Medicine. It had just been translated from Latin to German and from German into English. How many of you know Hildegard? Okay, so a few people. Well, in the introduction, I learned that Hildegard had been a 12th century German nun, that she was also a mystic, a visionary, a composer, and, as it turned out, a medical practitioner. And she'd written a book about her medicine. And it was not, as I read the book, the eye of newt, toe of frog medicine I expected from a medieval medical text. It was a real medicine for real patients with real diseases. But it was based on a completely different model of the body from our mechanical model. I couldn't quite put my finger on how it was different. It was a lot more like Chinese and Ayurvedic medicine. Uh, and I wondered if it wasn't perhaps the missing piece of Western medicine. And I decided that I was going to go back and get a PhD with Hildegard as my focus and try and understand pre-modern medicine using her book as my source. That's how I got to Laguna Honda Hospital in San Francisco, which was the only place that would let me practice medicine part-time while I went and got my PhD. So I went over for my interview, and when I saw it for the first time, I was taken aback. It did not look like a hospital at all. It looked like a medieval Romanesque monastery. It had cream-colored walls and a red-tiled roof and a bell tower and turrets. I went for my interview, and then after the interview, the medical director took me out for the tour. What well, turned out that the hospital, she explained to me, was originally called the San Francisco almshouse. The almshouse was how we used to take care of the sick poor before there was health insurance. The way the system worked is there, every, almost every county in the country had a free county hospital for the acutely ill and a free county almshouse for everyone else. Anyone you didn't know what to do with, you'd send to the almshouse. Now this is not the picture of L Laguna Honda that I practiced in. This was built in 1860s. It was the first San Francisco almshouse. And it's where I got the title of my book, because the word almshouse in French is Hotel Dieu, God's Hotel. So that's how I got the name for the book. And it's interesting to think about the fact that we used to call hospitals God's houses or God's hotels. And you can see that in Paris, it still is called the Hotel Dieu. This is actually a very interesting place. How many of you have been to Paris? Quite a few. And I bet you've all been to Notre Dame. Yes? I, I had too. I'd been many times and I'd never noticed that right next to Notre Dame is in fact the Hotel Dieu, where it's been since 661 AD when it was first established. And it was always, the Hotel Dieu's were always next to the cathedrals in that same parvis, right? Because they were part of the same thing. One was the physical care, one was the spiritual care. And it's still there. And what's really, let me go back here. Um, whoa. What's really interesting about it is that you can actually walk into it. The doors are wide open. And you, the, the hospital actually looks a lot like the Laguna Honda that I knew, actually, with its wide open areas, its wide open uh, halls for patients. So as we were walking around, the medical director was telling me this for the first time I was hearing it. The hospital was huge. It was on 62 acres of land in the middle of San Francisco. And we had 1,178 patients. So it was immense. And she showed me the long open wards that are called the Nightingale Wards that go all the way back to when monks and nuns used to take care of the sick poor for free in the old monastic hospitals. She showed me the operating room, which looked like where Humphrey Bogart has his face redone in Dark Passages. We walked past this 1950s era beauty salon with its steel helmet hair dryers. She showed me the chapel, which was more like a small church. It had wooden pews, stained glass windows, and a very politically incorrect stations of the cross along the walls. 
And then we went outside and she showed me the gardens. They were huge and extensive and the patients used to garden and actually farm there back when the other Laguna Honda was there. She showed me the greenhouse so patients could pot plants still to this day. An aviary so patients could watch chickens hatch from eggs and even a little farm so that patients could see animals even if they were bed bound. Then she walked me back to her office and she offered me the job. Well, I didn't know. I really wasn't sure. Laguna Honda was like no hospital I had ever seen or even imagined. So I told her I would come for two months. And I ended up staying for more than 20 years. Because it turned out that the place was an amazing place, first of all, to practice medicine. Because when you take care of that many patients, and typically the almshouse would take care of kind of the bottom one-tenth of one percent of people, you tend to get people who are two standard deviations from the mean, from any mean, right? The tallest and the shortest, the fattest and the thinnest, the oldest and the youngest, and the nicest and the meanest patients I ever had. And of course, they'd have every disease too. Because if you would, if a disease happened in one in 100,000 people, we'd have three cases. So it's a fascinating place. And I learned a tremendous amount of medicine there. And a tremendous amount of other things too. But if I had to put it into one sentence, which I've asked myself many times, if I had only one sentence to describe, it would be that medicine is personal. That's what I learned there, fundamentally and that when it's personal, it works. I, I've had a lot of disagreements with a friend of mine uh, who thinks that should be medicine has to be personal, right? But that medicine has to be personal suggests that medicine can, in fact, not be personal, right? When you say it has to be personal, you already agree that it, it, it could not be personal, right? But in order to really be medicine, it has to be personal. And what do I mean by works? I mean that the doctor is satisfied, the patient is satisfied, we have the right diagnosis, and the right treatment, all for the least amount of money. Now this gelled for me the day I ran into my friend, Dr. Curtis, who was coming back from outside the hospital. We met, I met him in the hallway and I asked him what he was doing. And he said, well, he was just coming back uh, and he was running over to see a patient who'd been at the hospital for months, ready for discharge, he could walk, but he was still zipping around in his wheelchair, still going to therapy. So Dr. Curtis said to me, so I asked him why he was still here when he could be discharged, when he could still walk. He said, no shoes, doc. They ordered me special shoes, but they're waiting for Medicaid to approve them. So, How long have they been waiting, Dr. Curtis asked. Three months. Dr. Curtis thought about that. What size shoe do you wear, he said. Size nine, and Dr. Curtis thought about the other patients he had to see and the charts he had to fill out, the quality assurance forms he had to do. Then he got in his car and drove to Walmart and bought a pair of size nine running shoes for $16.99. And now he was going back to the ward to put them on the patient and write the discharge orders himself. Was he going to submit his receipt for reimbursement, I asked? He laughed. And as I watched him walk back to uh, the ward, I thought about that and I realized he reminded me of an aphorism I'd always loved but had never understood. The secret in the care of the patient is in caring for the patient. I'd always thought that that meant caring about a patient, loving a patient, or at least liking them. But when I saw Dr. Curtis rushing back to put shoes on a patient he barely knew, I decided to look it up. And I found it in um, a journal from 1927 by a Dr. Francis Peabody to the medical, to the graduating class of Harvard. Turned out what Dr. Peabody actually said was not caring about a patient, but caring for a patient, which he explained meant doing the little things, the little personal things that nurses usually do, tucking a patient's bed close in, giving him sips of water. That wasn't, he admitted, the most efficient way for a doctor to spend his time, perhaps, but it is what created the personal relationship between doctor and patient. And that relationship, he said, was the secret of healing. 
So what he was really saying was that the secret of healing was inefficiency. It was particularly ironic because Laguna Honda had just hired a uh, consulting group of healthcare efficiency experts. And they were coming to the hospital and looking around for signs of inefficiency. And I'm sure if they had known about Dr. Curtis and those shoes, they would have thought it very inefficient, very wasteful of the time of a highly trained physician. But when you think about it, Dr. Curtis was providing the most efficient care of all. Providing the right diagnosis, no shoes. Providing the right treatment, shoes. And all for the least amount of money. I call this the efficiency of inefficiency. And it's what happens when medicine is personal. So in the meantime, I was doing my PhD in Hildegard of Bingen, who turned out to be an amazing, amazing woman. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a biography here. She was born in 1098, which was the, right around the end of the First Crusade, which the, was the only really successful crusade uh, for the West to recapture Jerusalem. And what was ironic about that is, although the West won that crusade, it lost culturally, lost in a, in a, with, with quotation marks, because it was it really the height of the Arabic Empire, and it was a very sophisticated culture. So having conquered Jerusalem, all of that Arabic culture came into the West with the new translations that people hadn't seen for decades, of, for millennia, of Aristotle, of Plato, and also of Galen, the uh, medical specialist. So it was a very fer uh, fomenting time during the 12th century, as some of you probably know. So Hildegard was born, and her life spanned the uh, entire uh, 12th century. She didn't die until she was 81. And uh, when she was eight, the family had her uh, uh, go into a monastery where she, uh, called Dizzy Bodenberg, where she stayed until she was in her 40s and began experiencing uh, visions. This is an example of one of her visions. It uh, was painted in her monastery while she was alive. It's a vision of the cosmos that we could talk about at the end of the talk if you wanted. And she started writing about her visions and writing um, explanations of what her visions meant theologically. And at the time in the church, this was kind of an iffy thing to do. And she, mm, she was told to stop, and she got sick and took to her bed and didn't speak for several months. Finally, her abbot came around and said she could start writing again. And eventually, she actually moved to, um, she took her nuns and left and went to Bingen, where she built a monastery for herself and her nuns. There she stayed for the next 50 years or so and ended up writing three other books on theology. And also composing chants, Two Saints' Lives, the first musical drama in Europe, and also she wrote a medical text, which is also very bold at the time. And this medical text is the oldest text that's come down to us of anybody uh, of pre-modern medicine, what pre-modern medicine was really like. And this was the, the basis of my dissertation. What I wanted to use it for was to understand how pre-modern medicine, so the medicine before the 1800s actually worked. And I wanted to understand it from the inside, kind of like an anthropologist would understand this medicine. So I learned her languages. I learned Latin and German, and I learned paleography and codicology so I could read the manuscripts in the original. And I also um, tried, I experimented with some of her uh, uh, potions and syrups. I brewed them up in my house. I brewed her medicinal beers. I planted an herbal garden. And I even baked her antidepressant cookies. And I gradually, as I read her and read the other people who were writing at the same time, I gradually began to get a sense of how her medicine differed from our mechanical model. I really particularly like this, uh, this slide. This was done by Fritz Kahn in the 1920s, and I think it's a very interesting um, example of how our sort of mechanical model of the body, where the body is a machine, or really a collection of machines, right? The body is the brain's a computer, 
the heart's a pump, the kidney's a filtering device. And Hildegard's model of the body was very different from a body as machine. Her idea was that the body was more like a plant than a machine. And that the doctor was more like a gardener than a mechanic. Well, what's the difference between a machine and a plant? The difference is that someone has to fix a broken machine, but a plant can heal itself. Hildegard called the power of a plant to heal itself its veriditas. From the Latin viridis, that means green. Veriditas is greenness. She assumed that the body, just like a plant, had its own veriditas, its own healing power, and that the role of the doctor should be to cultivate it, nurture it, nourish it, and remove obstructions to it, just like a gardener does. But I didn't really understand what she meant until one particular patient called, I call in the book Terry Becker. So Terry was homeless. She lived on the streets with her boyfriend, Mike. And they smoke, and they drank, and they took drugs. And then one day, Terry woke up, and she was paralyzed from the neck down. So she and Mike went over to the county hospital, and she was admitted, and there they diagnosed transverse myelitis, which is a very rare viral disease that has no treatment, but usually gets better on its own. So they sent her over to Laguna Honda, and she was my patient. And she did get better for those first few weeks. Then the first of the month rolled around when the homeless in San Francisco get their welfare cash from City Hall. And Mike showed up with alcohol and drugs. Terry went out with him, and she disappeared for about a year. Later, I found out that during that year, she was seen in the emergency room 28 times, that Mike once beat her up, took a two-by-four, broke her skull, broke her leg, robbed her and abandoned her on the street, that she'd been admitted to the hospital three times because she'd also developed a huge bed sore from sitting in her wheelchair all day long in the streets of San Francisco. And they kept trying to cover the bed sore with um, a graft, a skin graft. Every time Mike would show up with alcohol and drugs and out Terry would go and that skin graft would fail. Finally, the bed sore became too big to graft. So Terry showed up, and they sent her back to Laguna Honda, and she was my patient again. And when I saw that bed sore for the first time, I was absolutely shocked. It was enormous. It went from the middle of her back all the way down to her tailbone. And at the bottom of it, I could see bone, Terry's spine. And in the middle of it was all the decayed and decaying tissue from all the failed skin grafts. And as I looked at it, I thought, wow, that bed sore is really too big to graft. It would have to heal on its own. I couldn't use antibiotics because, prophylactically, because the germs would just get resistant to them. And there wasn't much left in my little black bag. So I walked back to my office, and I sat at my desk, and I stared into a plant that a patient had potted for me many years before that by this time had grown all over my wall. And I looked into that plant, and I thought, wow, this bed sore is a catastrophe and possibly the end of Terry Becker. And then suddenly I asked myself, well, what would Hildegard do? I mean, what would she do for this huge bed sore? And I thought about veriditas, and I thought about the idea that coursing through this Terry's body was this invisible power of life and healing. And I thought, maybe Hildegard wouldn't do anything at all. Maybe she would just remove what's in the way of veriditas. So I thought, well, what's in the way of veriditas? Well, all that junk at the middle of that bed sore is in the way, so all of it had to be removed. Anything that caught Terry's attention, wrinkled bedclothes or an uncomfortable mattress, had to be changed. Any medication she didn't need had to be stopped. Uncertainty, fear, hopelessness. Then I thought what Hildegard would do would be to fortify Veriditas with the basics, with 
good food, fresh air, sunlight, sleep. So that's what I did. And it was amazing how fast Hildegard's prescription started to work. Within just a few weeks, I began to see signs of healing at the base of that wound. Then the first of the month rolled around, and Mike showed up. He was still pretty cute, still wearing his little tight Levi's, still walking with his little strut. The nurses made him wait in the waiting room, and we all watched as Terry wheeled herself face down in her gurney the whole long length of the ward and went in to, to meet him. They were in there a long time. Finally, the door opened, and Mike came out and left. Terry had thrown him out. She told him never to come back. Then she stopped smoking, and her appetite came back, and that bed sore started to heal. Since I only examined it once a week, its healing seemed as miraculous as those time-lapse photos they show you where a plant grows from a seed in a, in a few minutes. That's how that bed sore started to heal as I watched it over the, over the time. First, the base of it started to glisten, shine, and then muscle appeared, and then fat, and then subcutaneous tissue. And all the times, the skin kind of crawled in from the edges so that the bed sore got shallower and shallower, smaller and smaller, until it looked like a big scab on top of Terry's back. And then the scab started to flake off, and there was new, perfect Terry Becker skin underneath. It took a long time. It took two and a half years. But we were in no hurry, and neither was she. And at the end of those two and a half years, the social worker found her family in the Midwest who wanted her to live with them. The hospital bought her a ticket and flew her out, and there she stayed and did not go back in the streets and lived for many years. Terry Becker changed the way I practice medicine. After Terry, I not only look at patients with the eye of the modern doctor and ask myself, what's wrong? And how can I fix it? I also step back and look at my patient in the context of his environment and ask myself, what's in the way of veriditas? And what can I do to strengthen it? What I find is that uh, both ways work well. I, I think of them as kind of as fast medicine and slow medicine. Hildegard's medicine is kind of slow medicine, as opposed to the fast medicine I also use. So it happens to work best with people usually who have slow diseases, diseases that are slow in coming on, hard to heal, or for which modern medicine has no treatment, as opposed to the fast medicine I also use, which works so well when people have an appendicitis, or hit by a car, or heart attack, or even cancer, but which doesn't work so well after the appendectomy, the angioplasty, or the chemotherapy. Now, it's easy to put these two ways in opposition, slow medicine and fast medicine. What I actually find is they work best together, almost the way our two eyes, when they work together, give us a three-dimensional view of the world. Now, by this time, I'd finished my PhD. And as a present to myself for finishing, I decided to walk the medieval pilgrimage from France over the Pyrenees to Santiago de Compostela in Spain. Has anyone here done this? Not yet. <laughs> you might, after I tell you about it. So you, you all know a little bit about pilgrimages, right? I mean, this is a Catholic university, yes? OK. So in the Middle Ages, being a, a pilgrim was a big deal. Being a pilgrim is what the medievals thought we all were. Pilgrims on the pilgrimage of life. Leaving our home at birth and traveling through time until we reach the spiritual goal of death. Along the way, feeling other to what we see around us. And in the Middle Ages, to make a physical pilgrimage was to make that metaphor real. There were three major pilgrimages in the Middle Ages. To Jerusalem, to Rome, and to Santiago de Compostela in Spain. It became a pilgrimage route in the ninth century. So it goes, there's actually 
there, in the Middle Ages, there were these four roots, the southern root, the northern root, Vézelay, and Le Puy. And it became a pilgrimage route in the ninth century when the body of St. James was discovered at the northern tip of Spain. This is the reliquary which still holds St. James' bones. A cathedral was built to hold his body, and this is the 12th century version with its front from the 17th century. The pilgrimage walk gradually became very popular. So by Hildegard's time, hundreds of thousands of people were walking that route every year in their classic attire, hat and cloak, stick and conch shell, which was the sign of the pilgrim. After the Middle Ages, though, the pilgrimage to Santiago was pretty much forgotten until the 1980s when it was rediscovered. And when I heard it was still possible to walk it in the medieval way, on the medieval paths, I was intrigued and I decided to do it. So I went with a friend from medical school and what we did was we decided to do the walk in four, diff four years of th about 300 miles each. We went in early September, which is a beautiful time in France and Spain. And every year we went back to exactly where our footsteps stopped the year before. We would put on our last year's clothes, lift up our walking sticks, and take the next step. And as soon as I heard the click of my stick on the path, I would be right back in that space of pilgrimage, right back where I'd been the year before, as if only a night had passed. Every year I learned something special that I took back to Laguna Honda. And I'll read you about what I took back to the hospital that second year from the book. The second section of the pilgrimage starts in the area of France known for its white limestone, the coast. The coast makes beautiful churches and castles, but hard stone paths that heat the pilgrim's feet and reflect white hot light into the pilgrim's face. It's also a depopulated part of France. Its villages are nearly empty, each one with a World War I monument that explains the emptiness. Entire families of sons wiped out at the Battle of the Marne, the Battle of the Somme. Rosalind, this is my pilgrim friend, and I could walk for hours without seeing anyone, although the countryside was still cultivated somehow with green farms and truffled oak forests. The experience that most stayed with me that year was our longest and hardest day. There was 12 miles to our lunch stop and eight miles to our evening shelter, which was a monastery that still offered pilgrim hospitality. It was the middle of a heat wave and hard going, and we didn't get to our lunch stop until 2 p.m. We lunched on the bread and cheese that we carried drank some water, and hurried along. Because the rules of the monastery were strict, supper was 7 p.m. If you weren't there by 7 p.m., our guidebook warned, well, there was always breakfast. We struggled through the heat, but around 6 o'clock, we realized we would never make it in time. We would have no supper. And as we stumbled along, although I can't say I felt sorry for myself, I did keep imagining a styrofoam ice chest with cold beer that the nuns kept for late arriving pilgrims. That wouldn't be so bad. With an ice cold beer, the bread and orange I had left would be fine. Then, click, click, my imagination would present a different scenario. A sink of lukewarm water, a dormitory with rows of iron cots. I would be hungry. There would be no privacy. It would be a tough night. Those eight miles took a long time. It was way past 7 p.m. when we arrived. As we walked through the monastery's gates, flushed and thirsty, out of the main door came a tiny, very old nun in dark blue habit and a white wimple. She too was flushed and sweating, but she was smiling. Her eyes behind her glasses twinkled. In French, she said, you made it. We were so worried. Come in. We followed her inside. With its stone floor, stone walls, and stone ceiling, the monastery was cool. Put your things here, she said, showing us the stone washroom. Wash up and hurry. We've delayed dinner. We washed up while Sister Monique waited, 
and then she led us to the dining room. There were pilgrims seated at a long table, which was set with carafes of red wine and cold water. We joined them, and then we were served one of our best meals ever. Soup, potato caper salad, French lentils, cheese, and for dessert, fresh cooked plums from the nun's own trees. It turned into a party, and the pilgrims we met that night interwove themselves with us for the rest of the walk to Compostela. After dinner, Sister Monique showed us to our rooms. There was no dormitory. I had my own room, whitewashed and plastered, with a sleigh bed of walnut and a rope mattress. In the night, a thunderstorm. In the morning, the monastery bells, and out of my window, I could see the nun's medicinal herb garden down below. The longest and hardest day turned out to be the opposite of what I'd expected. And over and over again, for the rest of that second section, that's how it would turn out. That was the main lesson I took from the pilgrimage that year. I began to see that a pilgrimage had a rhythm, a dailiness, just like at home. Every day I ate breakfast, started walking, and things happened. People showed up. I had adventures. Some I liked, some I didn't. Some I expected to like and did not like. Others I expected not to like and did like. I began to see that the unexpected, the inattendu in French, the unwaited for, was the only thing I could expect. One was presented with an experience, a person, whose value one did not know in advance. What seemed to be good might be bad. What seemed to be bad, good. One didn't know. One had to wait. That waiting to see how it would all turn out was what made pilgriming different from ordinary life, I began to see. But that year I learned I didn't have to leave it with my last footstep. If I wanted, I could take that kind of waiting home and have my daily life become a kind of pilgrimage. With that open expecting, I discovered that a day at the hospital was even more interesting. One never knew. All one knew was that there would be a beginning and a middle and an end to the day, just like on a pilgrimage. And just like on a pilgrimage, characters would appear. Patients, nurses, delivery men, doctors, with spiritual and moral messages if I chose to decipher them sometimes in words, sometimes in actions, sometimes in silence. Well, by this time, Laguna Honda had been discovered, not just by the healthcare efficiency experts, but by the lawyers. And neither of them liked what they saw. They didn't like the open wards, the open spaces, the entire unmanageability of the huge place. They demanded that San Francisco replace the old hospital, and build a new modern healthcare facility or close it down. There were a lot of battles, of course, but eventually San Francisco did rebuild and our patients moved into the new facility two years ago. And I took a sabbatical to write this book, God's Hotel, and reflect on what I'd experienced there. It seems to me that in the past 20 years, the pendulum in medicine has swung from the personal to the efficient. And I've been ever more impressed by how inefficient that efficiency is. In spite of everything the economists have done, healthcare costs keep rising, and no one quite knows why. But let me show you what I know very well, which is what happened at Laguna Honda. In the 20 years I was there, as a cost-cutting measure, the patients we took care of went down from 1,178 to 780. And correspondingly, the doctors went down as a cost-cutting measure from 32 to 9. And the clinical staff of nurses and therapists also went down from 1,500 to 1,200. And yet, the budget rose every year. What accounted for that? Well, as you can see, even though the clinical staff went down, the um, total staff stayed about the same. There was more and more administrators every year. What did all those administrators do? It's hard to know for sure, 
But the one thing there was more of at Laguna Honda when I first got there than when I left, when I, when I left than when I got there, was forms. When I first got there, there were two single page forms in the chart. By the time I left, the day before I left, I pulled a chart out randomly and I counted. There were 43 forms. And they were three page forms, five page forms. There were some 20 page forms in that chart. This is the little thing I put together uh, right before I left. Okay? And so you can see there's the patients going down, and there's the doctors going down, and there's the, clinical, the uh, staff staying about the same, and the budget going up every year. And this red line is the number of forms. And as you can see, if present trends continue, by 2024, there will be no patients at Laguna Honda. There will be two doctors. There will be 1,400 FTEs, a budget of $275 million, and an infinite number of forms. I call that doing less with more. Okay. And I don't think you can blame the administrators. They're just reacting to the regulations raining down on us. But I do think we could recognize that it's not what we meant to happen at all. At Laguna Honda, at any rate, what happened was that in the interest of efficiency, we became inefficient. In the interest of putting the patient first, we ended up having to put the real patient last. And in the interest of moving from uh, institution to community, we ended up with much more institution than we had community. There is some good news, though, and that is that uh, I think from the amazing reaction I had to, to my book, that there's a real sense now that the people needs to turn back from the efficient to the personal. And if I could do just one thing to give it a push in the right direction, it would be to put time unspecified time back into healthcare because it's that time that gives us the space to pursue our calling. And that's the most efficient healthcare of all. But it's not only the most efficient healthcare, it's what gives us the most back. Because when the relationship is personal, the doctor is healed as much by his patient as the patient is by the doctor. But the thing is, you can't be personal if you're not a person to begin with. And putting the humanities and science back together as they were in the pre-modern world is one good way to become a true person, which means not only studying, but journeying, being an open and curious pilgrim on your path. And that's all I have to say. Oh, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I know I don't have to tell you that uh, Dr. Victoria is open to questions. Yep. Um, or comments or disagreements. Or, 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 or if anybody has a good joke. Yeah. <laughs> and any answers, any solutions to this problem, I'm really, really open to. You she put up her question. Okay. Well, there's, you know, the book is sort of a summary of, there, there's a lot more in the book. Of course, I had to pick and choose. And one of the things that happens, happened in reality, and also so it happens in the book, is uh, I wouldn't say it was exactly more explicit, but I didn't start out with thinking it was going to be this way. I really did get to Laguna Honda purely accidentally. And over the years, these things kind of gradually came to me. So I talk, for instance, uh, about community and the sense of community. So I, I am somewhat more explicit 
uh, in the book, but I talk about the community of the place that was a community, a real community, uh, with the real meaning of the word community, which actually comes from a uh, wall, the word wall, to build a wall around. Right? We actually had a wall that was built by patients in 1917 because the original superintendent of the place, who was there for about 50 years, felt it was really good for patients to work if they could. So they were throwing away the um, cobblestones of the streets of San Francisco, and he decided that the patients, he would pay the patients to take the cobblestones and build a wall around Laguna Honda. So the property has a wall built by patients from 1917 of the cobblestones of San Francisco, and it creates, it, and it's part of its, its sort of metaphor for the sense of being a community inside a wall, and everything, you're sort of stuck with each other, right? So community was one principle I learned there. Charity was another principle I learned, right? Um, and integrity. Those were three fundamental principles I learned. The whole place sort of seeped it. It was, it was a very strange, and I think it had something to do with the fact that it really did look like a medieval Romanesque monastery inside and out. It had these, these layers. I mean, there's something about being in that kind of space. So it was actually a very spiritual place, and people knew about it. So I wasn't the only person to come for two months and stay for 20 years. For a long time, I thought that was just me. But as I gradually began to realize, I talked to somebody. Finally, I started asking everybody that I met at the hospital, how long have you been here? 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years. And I'd say to them, and how long did you think you'd come when you first got it? a year, two months, a couple of years. Nobody ever said they would, had come for more than five years. And sometimes it started asking people, well, why did you stay so long? And people couldn't really talk about it. They just really couldn't. And I think, so that's sort of hidden in the book because it's, it's hard to find a word for what happened there, but it was in fact really there. It was just this sense of things. And so it's interesting to compare it to the new place because we did move in two and a half years ago. And I'm, I haven't been back there as a doc, but I go back there regularly to, to kind of hang out with people, and it, it has a very different feeling. It feels much more like a hotel than a hospital or a hospice or a hostel or a God's hotel. It feels like a hotel, and it, it has that sense. You know, Patients are now in all their private rooms, and they've got their walls around them individually, and you have to make an effort to go meet people. Before, it was just kind of this, you were just in there with everybody, doctors and patients and nurses, everybody was kind of with each other. That's a little longer than you want, but it gives you maybe a little sense. Uh, she was, yeah. yeah um, You're next. When you talked about the forms, oh. I'm thinking a lot about medicine today, mm -hmm. about the fact that we have to practice defensive medicine in order to the fear of somebody looking in and saying, oh, if you would have only had an MRI and a PET scan and anything else, perhaps you could have picked up this, that, or the other thing mm -hmm. sooner. And I, I'm wondering if it's not in the forms connected with trying to prove to the healthcare provider that you've done everything you possibly could or to some future lawyer mm -hmm. that you've done everything you possibly could. And I'm wondering if that's the reason why we're seeing so much of an increase. Well, you know, the, the whole malpractice issue and being defensive, did people sort of hear that pretty much? Yes, right. about forms yeah. and defensive problems and malpractice and all that. You know, I don't actually think that's the cause of the forms. I think that people do practice defensive medicine and there's issues around them, but I don't think it causes the forms because we've had that around since the 70s. But we, the, the form, this, this is a completely different completely different thing, this, this number of forms. And I think it actually has a lot more to do with, I think, uh, I'll be out there a little bit, a, a pretty, no, I won't, I won't mention that. It's, it's kind, of, kind of like this balance has shifted from the people who actually take care of patients to a whole other group of people who are paying the bills, and therefore they get to do whatever they want, honestly. And, and that's, that is what happened. If you look at when, even at Laguna Honda, you can just plot when the forms happened as that sort of shifted. It's almost like going from whoever was taking care of, whether it was therapists, nurses, doctors, we're on the ground. When you are on the ground, you don't really need a form. I mean, most, you don't need a form to communicate because you're running into people all the time, right? But once the administrators, and it was Laguna Honda, it was really interesting just from a physical point of view. When I first got there, the head nurse, who in the book is Miss Lester. She's head director of nursing. She was there forever. She was 
one tough cookie. She had her little office right in the back of the hospital, which was where all the ambulance drivers come. Every single ambulance went right past her office. And right next to her was the medical director. And as this whole change had started to take place and we got these new, young, PhD types, right? The first thing they did when they got hired was move that little nursing office way away from the patients. It was so symbolic. And have it completely away from the patients in a whole other wing, and then they had the wing done, and they had the computers done. And they, in fact, talk about a form. They started a form that everybody had to fill out. So Miss Lester, who was director of nursing, she didn't have any forms at all. Every morning she got there at 6.30, even though we had 1,178 patients and 38 wards, every morning she went and walked through every ward and looked at every patient. Okay? Went to, so by the time she'd done that, after an hour or two, right, she'd seen every ward and every patient in the hospital. She didn't need a, she didn't need a form. So once the administration moved, suddenly there was a daily report. Every nurse had to fill out because everything was happening all the time. And so they spent all that, right? So that's just an example. So I don't actually think it's that. I think it's this whole power shift. And I think what, what everybody nodding heads here in terms of trying to get that to change, the clinicians, the people who are on the ground, we need to take it back. That's the thing. How are we going to do that? That's why I'm waiting for more hands to tell us how to do that. Yes! Oh, actually, please. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'll be the character of your uh, impact. Thank you very, very much. You're for welcome. Coming. And I, as far as I'm concerned, I believe that it was a direct blessing of our Lord to come and meet you and these other people here. And I lived in San Francisco for many years. And I never heard of Lagunda Honda. Huh. And I was up in the Hate Ashbury with Janice Joplin, the Grateful Dead. And then I was in the Catholic monastery for many years. Wow. Where is Laguna Honda? Oh, wow, that's so, what a great question. Where is Laguna Honda? Well, Besides in your I family. can tell you where it is. So where you were in the Hate? Yes. So if I'm standing in the Hate and I'm facing the city, it's yes. on the hill right behind the Hate. Really? Yeah, you needed to turn around. Stop smoking drugs, sister. <laughs> and uh, turn around, and it's on the hill there. Really? Yeah, it's actually, to me, it's really interesting. I was, a doc in, I was a doc in the city for 10 years. And I had, I had maybe once admitted a patient to Laguna Honda. And the only thing I knew about Laguna Honda until I visited it for my interview was that if you could get a patient into Laguna Honda, they never came back to you. Right. That's what I noticed. They never came back. They were taken care of. They, I don't know whether they died or got better, but they never came back. And so I had never seen the place either until I was driving, and I was being like, oh, my God, you know, like, how do they hide that? Because it's on a big old hill, and it overlooks the ocean, and it's just enormous. But So most San Franciscans who've, both native San Franciscans, and I'm not a native San Franciscan, know of Laguna Honda. And it's actually, it's been a pet of Laguna Honda for since the 1850s, and I, the whole history, there's a whole other piece that I haven't gotten to, I've written, but, you know, and it's, it's just, I'll tell you one little, it's sort of the pet of, Laguna, of San Francisco, so it's always been taken care of. So I remember reading something in the 1880s, there was the Ladies Fruit and Flower Mission, and it was, their mission was to, to bring fresh fruit and flowers once a week to the patients of Laguna Honda. And I, I just, Got a kick out of that, right? It was always in there. The, it's been fun doing research on it because there's this whole feeling, this sense of charity, this sense of community, this sense of taking care of those less fortunate to you and that it's a blessing for the person who does it. I mean, that's kind of what's been missing from this whole healthcare providing health. They don't, that's what they don't understand. It's not just a relationship. It's an interactive relationship that has its own beautifulness about it and it's not just about this sort of like you know all the quality assurance it makes me crazy but anyway so that's where it is okay well uh, thank you very much you're welcome and i suggest that uh, you buy your own insurance company <laughs> many many uh, of your uh, fellow uh, physicians and nurses in the entourage and start your own gate okay that's i'll take that under consideration Yes, sir. Um, I'm happy I went after her because um, I'm not native, but I did live in San Francisco for huh. many years. And 
I never knew. I've never seen it. <laughs> one of the things that broke my heart when I was reading the book. Oh, wow. I was wow. like, oh, my gosh. Mm -hmm. I would have thought, you know. And, yeah. Uh, so I really, I, was, I really enjoyed your book, but one of the, one of the, a few things came up, and um, you had mentioned at least a couple times in the book, I think, that you know how you get these patients, and it's just like, oh my gosh, how did someone miss this? Yes. Mm -hmm. Where they came from? Mm -hmm. And you mentioned B12 a couple times, mm -hmm. and um, it's interesting because I think you know they find in a lot of addicts and you know alcoholics. Mm -hmm. Yes. Quite yes, that's right. And is that something that, like, is that what accounted for it, the alcohol, alcoholism and, and the drug addiction? Or was there something else other than an intrinsic factor or whatnot where this B12 thing was going undiagnosed? Because I've heard about it in other places as well where all of a sudden some people oh my gosh, the B12, B12 health. Um, well, um, I would say this. I didn't find too much. So, so the bottom line is it's, it's well known that B, B, B12 deficiency is a cause of dementia. Okay? That's, the, right, that's the main thing that you want to check when somebody's demented is they don't have a B12 deficiency. So I'd pick up a fair number because as time's gone on and doctors don't do quite as thorough workup as they used to because they're in a hurry all the time or for whatever reasons, but I would have the chance to, to do that. So I would, that's just part of a, a normal dementia workup is to check a B12 level. As people age, they often, they don't make as much intrinsic factor. There's a lot of reasons why as people get older um, or alcoholics don't make as much B12 and they, they need more. So it's, it's kind of not a cause of alcoholism. It's just, it's just related. 